Advice from Olympic champion Michael Phelps on achieving your goals. This is the Focus Group. It's the savvy side of 9 to 5. Listen. Bueller. 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 Laugh. <laughs> and learn. Negotiation. This is what you do in business. This is the Focus Group with Tim Bennett. S-T-A-U-N-C-H. And John Nash. Keep your clothes looking neat and clean. We're all business. Except when we're not. Welcome to the Focus Group. John Nash here with my very good friend and co-host, Mr. Tim Bennett. Wearing United States rowing paraphernalia today. Uh, on Swag. sale. Swag. Boathouse, on, Boathouse Row. Sports. So this is a new thing. It's a new thing. This is not an old thing. It's a new thing. It's, it's, it was, I could say it was part of my Mac Weldon collection because I have something <laughs> similar. But you know, I, I, you know I love a blue yeah. half zip. You do. Well, that's what we learned on the Mac Weldon stuff. Hey, focusgroupradio.com is where we'd like you to go to find out all about our video and audio platforms. And while there, you could learn more about us and check out all our past shows as well. So today's show, uh, later on, we're going to have a little shop talk. And it comes to us courtesy of none other than Michael Phelps, one of the most meddled swimmers in Olympic history, right? I think he far outclassed Mark Spitz and anybody else, right? They say those swimmers have big floppy feet, like clown feet. <laughs> Wasn't that like the Thorpedo from Australia? I remember him? Uh, Thorp. The yeah. Thorpedo. They used to call him the Thorpedo. Yeah. But you look at their feet, they're like flippers. <laughs> and we're off. Phelps is like that, too. And we're right? off the rails already. Right? Phelps has got flippers for feet. Okay. Well, they know he's got a very uniquely, you talked about this about a body of a short torso, long legs, long feet, oh, I, I think long it was hands. A, um, yeah, very long hands. Yeah, Scientific American did an entire analysis on his physiology yeah. and how he's designed to like really move through the water because of, and and how lucky he was that he found the sport that really suited his body type so gonna be a gymnast that's yeah he's too tall for that so um yeah we're going to talk about that he has some interesting tricks for achieving goals which you know now that we're in our second official week of the new year i don't know why i'm obsessed with this like as each week ticks down maybe i'll lose interest after the 24th week of the what year what do you all wind up about the, about the year for it's already moving too fast for my taste it's the ninth. What happened to the first? <laughs> you know, it did go pretty quick. <laughs> Do you agree? I mean, 2018 was like zip, gone. Yeah, it did go pretty quick. Um, so I want to uh, ask you a couple. I want to talk about something really briefly. Uh -oh. So the other night we were, you know, in a, in a sea of millions of channels and hundreds of hours of things to watch. I can never find a thing to watch. I have commitment phobia and boys in the booth. We got Garrett on audio. We have John on video. Guys. It, you can do, can you guess what commitment phobia is? <laughs> yeah, I can guess. Go ahead. Uh, you afraid to get married? No, yeah. no, no. It relates to TV and and shows. Oh, long shows that just have too much commitment. The storyline, the characters, the lineage. There you go. Yeah, there be 30 you go. Thirty minutes in and out. And I don't want. I feel like if I start watching something, and I commit to it. I've, I, I've given up my precious time. So instead, I spend a half hour going through Hulu and Netflix and... and Your click, People click, Magazine click, 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 versus click. The New Yorker. Yeah. And, I just, and, I just, and I end up watching things that I've watched, that, like comfort food for the soul, old stuff. So Bob goes, stop this. He goes, I want to watch this. And he goes to Amazon Prime, and he puts on the movie Baby Boom with Diane Keaton. Do you remember Baby Boom? No, I don't. Are you serious? Oh, my God. Okay, so Diane Keaton plays an up-and-coming advertising executive. She's on the partner track. And she gets a call from England that, that she has an inheritance from two cousins who passed away, a husband and a wife. Or it's a husband. And, and she has to go to JFK to get the inheritance. She gets to JFK, and it's a baby. She was listed as the... The guardian that would, because since both parents died right. simultaneously, she gets this little baby girl named Elizabeth. Well, comedy ensues in in that she has no idea what to do with it. This is mucking up her her here. Thank you. <laughs> That's so eighties. The big shoulders. This? Oh, I'm thinking eighty six maybe. I should I should probably double check the year. But it was um, out and about in the eighties. <laughs> I love Baby Boom. So it mucks up everything up, and she's taken, and she's getting, she gets taken off the fast track at the agency, and she eventually gets taken off the big account that she's on, and she leaves the city, and she goes to Vermont. She buys an orchard, unsight unseen, in a house, and she she takes care of this girl, and she eventually. Uh, creates a line of baby food called Country Baby, and she comes back to New York, and she's back. She's back on top, but she makes the decision to stay in Vermont the whole bit. But the movie 
And See, this is what you watched? Well, it's one of my favorites. So Bob wanted to watch Oh, this? yeah, and I get sucked in right away because I've seen Baby Boom a number of times, and I think Diane Keaton turns in a perfect Diane Keaton performance. But as the movie was progressing, <laughs> Bob says to me, could this have been made today? And seeing the movie in the lens of 2018, I'm like, wow, this, this would be picked apart down to the frame level. You know, uh, what is a woman's role? Like she's on the partner track, but she, ha she has to act different than all the, you know what I'm getting at? Yeah. So all the stuff that we, all the media and the TV shows and the movies we used to like, they're all kind of built on these social premises that have entirely changed, right? Yes. So I still enjoy Baby Boom, but I could look at it and say, this might not hold, like there is audience, an audience today, depending on your age, you might not like the movie based well, we on were, Diane right, Keaton's character. We, we were at the end of the Baby Boom, and although they called us Generation Jones, because we were at the very tail end, because in some cases our parents were also Baby Boomers. Yep. But we've said that about a lot of movies. There's many movies today that I don't think could get made. Uh, Animal An House. Animal House, Blazing Saddles. Um, Ever watch Blazing Saddles on TV? Anybody? It's not the same movie because they they hack out, yeah. they bleep out all the words, you know. And I, <sighs> and it was made for that precise reason. All the language that Mel Brooks had, yeah. you know, that was to definitely say, "Hey, look at what you're doing." But but it goes to a it goes to a different time. And I we had talked on our our podcast TFG unbuttoned about an issue that Martina ran into by making a comment that she was immediately labeled transphobic and she was anti this and anti that and anyone who knows Martina Navratilova knows that she's the least um, bit transphobic or anti LGBT rights or whatever but she had said something that she it was an ob it, you know it was an, an observation, observation. Right. she said if if a a male transitions to female and then competes in, in women's only sports. Perhaps we should look at that differently. Right. I think she that was the extent of it because each case is different, and we, case should, is right, different. we should look at it individually. But you know, this was about a um, a woman who was a, is a national cycling champion, Canadian cyclist. Yeah, yeah. and um, it, she got into a Twitter feud. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when I hear the word feud, I think of the Hatfields and the McCoys, and I know Twitter is almost like you know, the Wild West, right? It's a Twitter feud. I, uh, 12 noon, the 12 two feud, gunslingers come out. Twitter feud. Well, everybody can hide da, 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 behind da, 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 there because yeah. it's, easy, it's easy to hide behind and, and all those sort of stuff. But I, I, um, I miss that sort of movie for its time and place. But you're right. It's, it's, it's what's going on now. I... Just recently, the, in the in, uh, over the uh, over the break, when the new Congress came in, um, the rep the Congress person from Detroit said, "We're going to impeach the MFR." Yeah, I immediately said, "You know what? That's not helpful." I'm more of the Michelle Obama when they go low, oh, we you go, go high. high. Yeah. But then there's a whole group of people. No, that's exactly what she should have said. She should have done that. And I'm always of the opinion that politics, regardless of what side, should be civil. And the senators treat each other with respect. And, and they, they have some sort of decorum. Unfortunately, maybe, we're, maybe that's gone, too. I don't think it's gone. And I do think there's a great, a vast majority of Americans who would like more civility and just get to work and solve the problem. It's all about concessions and it's all about deal making. What did you think about her saying that? You know, oh, I cringed. Eight minutes, eight I, minutes I, after Eight minutes was... into the new Congress. I cringed and I thought, now she's walked it back and explained that it was, you know, learning a teaching moment. I love when people say it's a teaching moment. All our lives are teaching moments. Every day, if you're open to being taught, <laughs> you could learn something new. But she regrets, she said, you know, I will, that's how she spoke to her uh, her constituents, and that's what got her elected. And so that's that whole notion of that's why I'm in Washington, because I'm going to do this, this, and this. But again, you come in, into a body whose collective goal is to negotiate and make things happen. Maybe you have to put that off to the side for a while. Um, and no, I don't think it's helpful. And I'm frankly very glad that Pelosi and Schumer are downpedaling and not saying a word about impeachment. And in fact, I saw something recently where they said that, you know, both leaders would really prefer not to go down that road and just have this happen at the ballot box. Do you want to get rid of the president, vote him out of office at the next election? Well, because by the time impeachment hearings and everything start, yeah, you'll probably yeah, beat up to that point anyway. But no, back to this, this baby boom thing. Um, it, it got me thinking, and you said it already, that there's so much of our collective cultural history, depending on the age, depending on the decade you were born in, 
there, there was a and comedians do this too. There's a whole set of assumptions made about the audience. Like, oh, okay, so if you're watching TV from the 70s or 60s, women were homebodies, maybe not by choice, but by societal, the role was a woman was the that she raised the kids, she took care of the house. Traditional roles for women were nurses, teachers maybe doctor you know that all came in yeah our generation saw a huge shift in what women can do so some of the humor around that revolves around you know you think of lucy well i think yeah. i think of lucy a lot and those shows hold up for so many reasons you're now 60 years old plus but she was a housewife yeah now she was a scheming, clever. She funny. wanted to do something else, but she was that was mm -hmm. her role. And I, I laugh because I, I always tease Richard about this. You, whether it's um, Alice Mitchell and Dennis and Menace, or it's Mrs. Wilson and Dennis and Menace, or it's um, uh, and Father's Knows Best, That's any of the good. mothers, Beaver, uh, Leave mm -hmm. It to Beaver, they're all the June women in the Beaver. morning. <laughs> It's the morning time. She's dressed. They're dressed to the nines She's with the, the pearls, pearls, the apron. Everyone else is coming downstairs. She's already been up. There's things on the stove. Stacks cake getting ready, cakes. right? Getting yeah. dessert ready for dinner. What are we going to have? We're going to have a roast. She's oh. got to go to the PTA meeting. She's We're going to have a pineapple upside down cake. Pineapple upside down cake. <laughs> and I laugh because I said that, you know, that's that was. Here's one for you. That was a time. I was thinking about you over the, uh, over the holidays because I landed on a Lucy Marathon. And the episode that I landed on was one where... Um, was it I Love Lucy or was it... The I Love Lucy. Okay. And Lucy was convinced that Ricky wanted to kill her. So what, And she's locked herself in the bedroom. And at one point, Fred Mertz comes up and, and Fred says, you got you to gotta bring Lucy down. You gotta give, I got a pill here for that. They basically were giving her like a roofie or something. <laughs> and there was some game where Ricky figured out, or she figured out what Ricky was doing. She switched the glasses that had the pill in it. He figured out that she knew he switched the glasses. He gave her the... Would they ever on network television suggest that a man give a woman some kind of a drug to take her down, to calm her down? You need, you need to... It's you know. Cosby. That's <laughs> got Cosby. Now, the episode was hilarious, but I can see where a, a cultural critic or today's environment would begin to nitpick that. Well, there's episodes where he bends her over his knee and spanks her. He spanks her. Yeah, and, and we still laugh at it. Now, especially me, because we grew up watching this stuff, but um, it, it just... So the movie, Baby Boom ends, I have that good feeling about watching the movie, but I also had this weird feeling that I'm laughing at things that I'm not allowed to laugh at anymore, or that the character I like so much, this, the, the role that Diane Keaton plays, I'm finding amusing because she's in a position, she's not in a position of authority, she's, you know I'm getting at, like... What I find upsetting, though, is people haven't changed. No. They're still, yeah. you know what, and we used to say this, and stereotypes happen for a reason. Reason, yeah. And... So much of it is harmless, and I think people take so much of it as being um, being evil or being um, hurtful, overpowering or whatever. But yeah. some of it is just funny. I don't know. I find some of it just funny. I agree. All right. All right well, on, on, that, on that note, I'm going to ask you what caught your eye this week. What caught your eye? Here's what Tim and John found. Since 9-11, I haven't flown much. <laughs> yeah, we haven't flown a lot. We haven't flown a lot, but you know, back in the heyday, you and I have talked about this. Mm. Airline food, as much as a lot of people complained, if you were fortunate enough to fly as many miles as I used to fly, and a lot of it was because it was international, so I'd rack up the miles. So anytime I would fly domestically, particularly going out to Los Angeles to doing uh, TV shoots and whatever, I would get to fly in business or first class. And I will tell you, the food was really quite good. I, whenever I've flown business or first, I have no complaints. <laughs> back in the day, and this was before 9-11, but back in the day when you had the full silverware and oh, they would yeah. come down with the cart and they would have they would have roast beef that they'd slice on the plane for you. I mean, hot roast beef, how they did it, I don't know. I don't know. And do you remember the ice cream cart? The ice cream cart would come by and make your own Sunday. United, make your own Sunday. Cart, the great, yeah. All kinds of great things. So I laughed at this when I saw it. The headline was... United Airlines' new cookbook has just been released. Now you can make airline food at home. So there's a... Well, they do have chefs. Right. Yeah, there are airline chefs, so this is not exactly like... So apparently business class is now called Polaris. I didn't know that. Did you know that? <laughs> no. I'd like Polaris glass, please. I mean, right. that's okay. So it says this isn't a joke. Some people might think it's a punchline, but there's a whole cookbook dedicated to United Airlines food and they said, quite frankly, it's not as bad as some people may think it sounds. So the United Executive Chefs have teamed up with chefs from the Trotter Project, 
which is a nonprofit organization that provides education to disadvantaged young chefs. And they've created this cookbook, and it's all the good stuff from business class. So they said it features uh, recipes that were inspired by meal, meals that are served in United Airlines business class, a.k.a. Polaris. And that's why they named the cookbook Polaris. I never knew that. That must be something. I almost new. feel like buying this. Well, they're not actually, they said in some cases, they're not necessarily the actual meals you're going to uh, oh, get if you fly. Oh. Some of the recipes are directly from the in-flight menu. A few of them they might have spiced differently. It's, it's one of those objects in me are closer than they appear kind well, of They thing. said in some <laughs> cases they could, you could do more with spices or whatever in your home than you would do on the airline. And uh, somebody had tried it. They said it's actually a pretty decent cookbook. They said um, this isn't the first time that an airline has released a cookbook. Southwest Airlines put a book together called Feel the Spirit, Savor the Fair in 2006. But that was really just recipes that came from uh, flight attendants and people at the airline that did their own cookbook. And they said in 1987, Delta did one as well called First Class Meals, which was recipes from the flight attendants. So they said that uh, this cookbook is available on the United website for $29.99. And uh, it reminded me of, I thought it would be a fun thing to do with friends or if you were doing one of these um, neighborhood things where everybody does a meal. It's almost like that Julie and Julia where you got to make, everybody's got to make one of the airline meals. Now, you know, I'm smiling and laughing because I'm wondering if there's a way to do that and then to make sure you serve the meals the way you would get served on a plane. We'll say that. You know, like on this little tray, you know, however it works so that it's the plastic thing. Well, they suggest you do it and not tell people it's airline food or airline recipes until after you're finished eating. And somebody says, oh, that was delicious. Well, that was from my United you Airlines cookbook. Um, do you know? Do you remember? Because we read very different. Uh, you know, I so should know. I might have deleted it. It was... Um, it might have been USA Today via the Detroit Free okay, Press. Okay. Like, you know what? It might have been the Detroit Free, Free Press, Press because it was looking at something automotive. And uh, it, it might have popped come up. from there. Yeah. <laughs> but I thought it was it was funny because uh, I've had good. I used to love the burger on United. I used to love the salmon. And I always loved flying out of Portland, Oregon because there were so many vegans. So you could get extra because sometimes they wouldn't have enough. They'd have too many meat meals. And so they'd be oh, like, really? Okay. So you should be like, I got an extra burger. You know, you'd be, you'd be somewhere over Chicago with another three hours to go. You want another burger? I used to fly every two weeks. I flew to San Diego for one of our, our accounts when I owned my ad agency, my second agency. Um, oh, it was the first one, actually. This goes way back. And um, because of the amount of times I would travel, I ended up always getting bumped up to first on miles or whatever it was. I've told the story before. About the bottle of wine. Yep. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> the the steward gave me a bottle of wine when we it's landed. It's funny because you don't really like wine that much. No, no. But I had one of those splitting ice pick headaches from uh, the deep the pressurization change because San Diego is a weird airport. It's literally built. The city's built around the army base, so they right. yeah. So they have to descend really quickly. But I never. I used to love. Right before landing, there's two things. After dinner, they'd do the ice cream cart. Yep. And then right before landing, it was chocolate. It was warm, cho warm milk and a hot and a chocolate chip cookie. And, you know, you're like, yeah, thank yeah. you. And you get off the plane feeling great. So no, none of that anymore. Well, I um, my uh, caught my eye goes to another politically correct thing, and it's out of England or the UK. And the headline reads: Crackdown on sexist ads outlaws bad female driver and inept dad commercials. So back in 2015, um, if you're not watching on this stream, there's an ad up of a woman in a bikini and there's a headline reads, and it's from the tube. You can tell because the posters curve like the, the tube stations. Are you beach body ready? So um, a public a public furor ensued over this poster on the subway system showing a woman in a bikini. Um, and Hello, it, bikini. And it prompted a regulating agency called the Committee of Advertising practice, CAP, <laughs> C-A-P for short, CAP's going to get you, to look into all gender portrayals in British advertising. Um, the ad for a weight loss product was not banned, um, but it, did, it, it, it broke a few rules and was eventually pulled. So now um, there are new rules that are very, if you and I were doing advertising nowadays, we'd have no way of figuring this out. Be in trouble? Depictions of girls as less academic than boys or men being belittled for unmanly behavior will be soon a thing of the past. 
So it bans companies from including, quote, gender stereotypes that are likely to cause harm or serious or widespread offense in both print and TV ads. Advertisers will have to tread carefully in scenarios the watchdog cites as problematic. These include commercials that show a man with his feet up while a woman cleans, a, ma a man or woman failing at a task because of their gender, you see where I'm going? The suggestions that a person's physique has held them back from romantic or social success, or a man being belittled for performing stereotypically female acts. So this is basically... Unique advertising. Now you could basically... I could do an ad right now. This is a pen. It writes words if you want to write words. It can draw pictures if you want to draw pictures. Buy this pen for nine ninety nine. I mean, <laughs> there's no, what scenario? Like I'm being an, I'm being a fool about you know, it. You'd be in trouble though because not everybody has hands. <laughs> there you go. Use your teeth. So I it, uh, all these these new rules go into effect on June fourteenth and um, in the UK. Yes, but then the article ends by saying the watchdog emphasized that the new guidance does not bar commercials from featuring quote glamorous, attractive, successful, aspirational, or healthy people or lifestyles, as seen in the many perfume ads that are on the billboards. It isn't a ban on products developed for and aimed at our at one gender. Um, it said, or the use of gender stereotypes as a means to challenge their negative effects. So I'm a creative director. I'm sitting in a, a room. Art directors are giving me ideas that everybody's kind of, you know. Look, if, if I were still at my agency, I don't know how I'd navigate this because some of the advertising, our best and award winning advertising, leveraged some of these cultural touch points. Lynch points. Yeah, linchpins in culture. Like, you know, I don't know. I laugh because when you think about British comedy or British TV, British films, they're yeah. full of. Stereotype in any window, aren't they? Mm -hmm. I Completely. don't know. Completely. I'm, I'm, I'm at a loss for words, John. You, you, just one more area where the clamp down's happening. And, and by the way, the thing that really killed me about this piece was isn't that a completely the most subjective thing you've ever heard of? Yeah. Who's determining? So if a guy's, if there's an ad showing a woman vacuuming a room and the guy has his feet up on an ottoman, who makes the determination that somehow there's a gender inequality issue there? Maybe she likes to vacuum. I actually like vacuuming. <laughs> if you show me vacuuming, is this a problem? I mean, I... But how... So it's so subjective that I think that there, people are going to get so neutral and so safe that advertising is going to not be Well, fun. there was one, and you might have done it a few months ago, but there was one about toy advertising was the same thing. That you're, they're not going to let... You just show girls playing with dolls and boys playing with trucks. If you're advertising the Easy Bake Oven, you have to have a boy in the picture because maybe he wants to make a cake too. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> on to your... Uh... <laughs> I don't know what to say. This is birthday. Everyone does celebrity birthday greetings, but the Focus Group is the only show in the universe that celebrates business birthdays. I checked a number of sources, and he was born either January 4th or January 9th. <laughs> and it was 50-50, and I stopped looking. Some say he's born January 4th. Some say he's born today, January 9th. John Richard Jack J.R. Simplot. Died in 2008 and 99, an American entrepreneur and businessman, or business person. Is he a Texan? Best known as the founder, no, he's from Idaho. Oh, God, because he got the cowboy hat on. Cowboy, real cowboy. Best known as the founder of the J.R. Simplot Company in Boise, Idaho. He's an agriculture supplier specializing in potato products, or as my grandfather, Canadian grandfather, worked in a potato factory and starch, and made starch in Maine, called them potatoes. 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 Worked in a potato factory in Maine. Potatoes. 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 We're going to have potatoes tonight? In 2007, he was estimated to be the 89th richest person in the United States with $3.6 billion. At the time of his death in 08, he was the oldest billionaire, according to Forbes. A potato billionaire. Potato billionaire. He uh, had problems with his father growing up. Who didn't? <laughs> I was waiting. Perfect. Boom, boom, boom. He quit school in the eighth grade and left home. Strike it out at his own at 14. Then you could do that in the 20s. You could do that. I mean, you could yeah. leave home at 14. He worked on a farm and developed a creative method for feeding hogs before he got into the potato business. 
And uh, by World War II, he became the largest shipper of fresh potatoes in the nation. Here's where we talk about luck, John. Right? A lot of business. A lot, there's, a, there's an amount of... A threat of luck runs of luck. success stories, yeah. 1967, he happened to meet McDonald's founder Ray Kroc. Oh, my God. He agreed with Ray by handshake that the Simplot company would provide frozen French fries to the restaurant chain. What year was this? The reason being 1967. The reason oh being, God. previously, all the McDonald's restaurants had to hand cut the French fries. The, best, the French fries that you get at McDonald's are russet brand. They're russet. Russet, russet potatoes. Russet potatoes. Potatoes. <laughs> However, they're not available in the summer months, so it led to a quality problem. So McDonald's was trying to figure out, we don't want to change the French fries in the summer. We want to make sure we have a consistent product all year long. They were looking for consistency. Simplot you know. figured out how to supply frozen potatoes, potatoes, russet potatoes, all year long. So in 1972, all French fries at McDonald's became frozen russet potatoes and uh so this obviously this deal led to quite quite a lot of success who doesn't love mcdonald's french fries my uh sister my older sister was just it should be in the smithsonian we, we literally i just aren't. two days ago i saw my older sister and we were for some reason we got on the thing of the large fries and you cannot you can ignore a lot of other Salt, food everything but the fries there's something about the fries right i have friends that would do and the fourth of july they would do a crab feast so they would make crabs and everything they go and buy fries go to mcdonald's and they would call ahead and say we we want 50 large fries and they'd go through the and they, they've been doing this for years Do people know oh yeah but they okay. would but they would bring them back to the house because they were like there's nothing better with their crab fest than these mcdonald's fries a great idea yeah so they would order them they'd run down send somebody down they knew they were coming down to pick up all these fries so um, this deal obviously helped put him on the map and earn him billions of dollars he retired as chairman and and in, uh, in uh, 70 he became he retired as president in 73 remained as chairman until 94 he also invested a lot of his money into micron technology and uh, Remington oil and computer memory chips. He was also involved in a number of ski resorts and ski mountains out in Idaho. He then expanded into Australia in 95. He acquired uh, brands like Bird's Eye, Lego. I think like Lego My, yeah. Lego My Ego. Oh, oh, no, Ego was the brand. Oh, what would Lego be? The toy. No, L-E-G-G-O. Oh, that's different. Isn't that nylons? Yeah, uh, yeah, I don't know. The Lego nylons. Well, bird's eye, we know what that is, frozen vegetables. <laughs> His first wife, and I only say this just because I think it's a great drag name. His first wife's name was Ruby Rosevere. That is a good made that's almost a made up name. Yeah, Ruby Rosevere. Ruby Rosevere. They, they got married in Glens Ferry. He um, before his death, they resided at the Grove Hotel in downtown Boise. Now when you and I had done our trip through Boise, it would have been fun to see what the Grove Hotel looked like. I can't imagine. But it was only a few blocks from the company headquarters. The family donated their huge home. Uh, north of Boise to the state of Idaho for the governor's mansion. After he died, the state decided they didn't want it, ripped it down. So there's a <laughs> there's a picture if you're watching of him with it. That's his house on the hill. That was the one with the weird. Apparently, it was enormous and it, 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 yeah, it took it was it just was a money pit and way too much to take care of. But he left it thinking it would be a great governor's mansion. But uh, they they've since ripped yeah, it down. I, I kind of get the tearing it down part. <laughs> Me. <laughs> he died suddenly in 08 with his wife by a side of pneumonia. Did she die too? She died later. But um, he's buried in Boise, Idaho. So it's, uh, no, he just died in the morning. John Richard Simplot, the Bedata, the Bedata, Bedata billion, the billionaire. But, oh that, but that goes to something we've said all along about the amount of luck that sometimes happens um, in business. Can you imagine meeting Ray Kroc? Well, of course, you wouldn't know anything about it then, right? 1967. Oh, no, no. McDonald's certainly wasn't what it was. 67, the Golden Arches was, we, we, that was part of our childhood. Like, that was the special trip to yeah. go to get the McDonald's to get the hamburger and the french fries. The potatoes. And the potatoes. <laughs> but yeah, it was a smaller chain, but still, even at that scale, you would have made a lot of money supplying yes. with, with Ray Kroc. Wow. Yep, yep, yep. Good business birthday. Hey, everybody. As you know, hey, everybody. Uh, and, or you don't know, Deep Discount has been a partner of ours here for a while. And guess who's ma guess who's making an appearance today? Arr, the shark. Sharky's making Let's his first appearance of 2019. It's the New Year's sale, and that means holidays are over. Buy something for yourself. 
So Sharky's a little picture. You practice now. that? Arr, no, I I've been trying to practice my puppetry skills. So here's I, 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 I was here's the challenge, folks. See, this is like a true hand puppet, meaning it only. Well, could I, you do it over here like this? I need like if to you were find. Underneath? Arr, I look yeah, like I'm a stunted little shark. You need to get your little tank in front of you that you can put up. There you go. <laughs> what I need to find, and maybe a listener will help us, is I want a bro like a longer puppet, like something goes over your arms. So then you could do that, like you were suggesting. Let me see that puppet. <laughs> so anyway, Deep Discount is a partner of ours here on the Focus Group. They've been with us for a long time. We want to thank them for the support of the show. Go to focusgroupradio.com and click on Sharky the Shark logo. And I remember the day we found that puppet. That was down at Rehoboth. We, we love the puppet. So as Sharky said, it's the holidays are over and it's the New Year's sale continuing. And as our friends at uh, Deep Discount, Lauren and our friend Lori, say when they send us the material she says holidays are over buy something for yourself exclamation point i take that up wholeheartedly so tim if it's a new year's sale what are you what are you thinking of uh you you went to the site you found something you might have liked yes i did and I, I found it based upon what happened to me over the over the new year i was at a house party over the new year and i i, I love music as you know john I think I often, in a different life, you could have been a DJ. Could have been a DJ, and I get upset when people put on bad music at a party. There's no often. reason for bad music. Happens often, happens often. So I didn't know what to do, and I, I said to somebody, I said, here, just put on something. It was a crowd all about our age. And I said, you need to put on something that's going to conjure up either conversation or memory, whatever. And so, you know, of course, you fall back on the 80s. So I looked at Deep Discount. This is an import. It's called Strictly 80s, various imports. It's under 20 bucks, and it's three discs. For a grand total of 1783, not bad, right? So it's 60 top 100 hits and 20 number one singles from the 80s. 60 top 100, or top, I'm sorry, top 10 hits. So 60 top 10 hits from the 80s. Give us an example of some of your Plus 20 favorites. number one singles. Well, you just, you know, you can't, so it was, you know, John, it was there, a big hair and parties and extravagance, and people were talking about Shoulders. where they were when they hold these things. Shoulder Shoulders. pads. <laughs> Every song had a, had a, had a, a saxophone in it mm -hmm. somewhere, right, usually. But the, Rick Astley... Yeah. Now you remember him, but he was probably toward the late, but everyone from Duran Duran, Human League, Cindy Lauper, Kim Wilde, Yaz, Black Box, remember that? Right on time. So dance music, fun other music, your band, Banana Rama, mm -hmm. Dead or Alive, Donna Summer, Taylor Dane, Culture Club, Frankie Goes to Hollywood, Simple Minds, Elton John, Spandau Ballet, Cher, Tears for Fears. Cher. Cher. Swing Out Sister, Kim Carnes, ABC, ABBA. Diana Ross, Paul Abdul, the Jacksons, it goes on and on. Rockwell, somebody's watching me. Remember that Michael Jackson song? I believe Michael's on that track, yeah. Boy, girl, our boy George. Got this feeling. Lips. Yeah, I mean, it's... Somebody's watching me. You couldn't buy this with, without spending I, I'm like a lot already of hooked because yeah. this is like listening to only your favorite songs from like a big 80s channel or something. So it came out, it was released in, in last year, and well, now two years ago now, 2017. But uh, as you said, it's uh, it's seventeen sixty three at d deep discount. You save close to thirty percent, and it's under the New Year sale. So I thought, sale. if you're looking for something to have at your house to make sure that you can keep the party going, if you're of a certain age. <laughs> well, a lot of people... I don't know if the boys like eighties music in the booth. Totally yeah. grew up in the eighties. Oh, it's, okay. It's See, making a new comeback 90s, too. But... Is it like the fifties when we were growing up? Maybe. <laughs> it's good stuff. Check out Vaporwave. What's Ooh. Vaporwave? It's new music, but it uses like old 80s songs in a really slowed down or sped up way. What's that on? I just, just wrote just it down, it Garrett. On YouTube. On the YouTube. Vaporwave. Yep. Vaporwave. It's, it's good like cleaning the house music kind of stuff. There's no <laughs> lyrics. It's just like cool beats. And Are you those. cleaning the house or is your girlfriend cleaning the house? Oh, you know. <laughs> I'm cleaning the house. Yeah, that's, that's John was talking about gender, gender roles. We share. We share you, oh, you share the gender roles. Yeah. That's a that's a smart one. I cook any... most of the time. You she do does cook. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that's that that's a cook. big pass card in my book. You, you that that means that all other things should be done for you, like your cleaning and stuff. Yeah. Like you know why John cooks? Because he wants to be in control of what he's eating. Garrett. I mean Garrett. Oh. Uh, it was real, mostly because of like I got sick of ordering Chinese every night kind of thing, and I just got fell into it. Pragmatic. Yeah. It's very pragmatic. Do you cook, John? I used to, but now I just go out to eat all the time. Wow. Yeah, it's easier and quicker. <laughs> but Garrett cooks really well. Every day at lunch, he's got a beautiful little goulash to eat. That you brought in? How can we? A little goulash. Yeah, but one of Bob's favorite things is a little goulash, by the way. I'm, I'm a fan, too. So totally unrelated. 
Um, I picked a movie uh, that I recommend heartily because it stars Natalie Portman, who I happen to like, and it's called Jackie. Did you see Jackie? No. So it's a, she she portrays Jacqueline Bouvier Kennedy, and and during her time in the White House up to the point where the uh, president is assassinated. Maybe and I did see that. I think you did. Was it a bio, bio what do they call that? Uh, biopic. biopic. Yeah. But I thought Natalie Portman channeled, not, you know, from all the footage I've seen of Jackie speaking, I thought Natalie Portman did a really good job of recreating that accent and the poise. And, and the movie picks up where she's doing that famous TV tour of the White House. This is the... This is Little Edie on lithium. <laughs> this is where we have everybody come in this and have a wonderful... This is our favorite room. This is where everyone has a wonderful time. But it's I would, like Liberace. Yeah, I would definitely uh, recommend Jackie. It's, it's, a, it's a good movie, and I think it's a, it's a particular look and take on who she was um, at that time. And talk about somebody who stayed in her line, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Stayed in her lane. You stayed bet. in her lane. She sure did. New release is uh, mid-90s. On It's on Blu-ray. And the movie takes place in Clinton-era L.A. So we're going back a bit. And the director is Jonah Hill, who I happen to like a great deal. I believe it's his, his debut as a writer and director. And this is kind of, I, you know, when I read about the movie when it came out and, and when I read the reviews, which were not bad at all, it's sort of autobiographical. That was my take on it. Um, so it's, the movie focuses on a little boy named Stevie who wasn't getting much attention from his mom uh, and, and picked on at school. But he falls in line. He falls in with a pack of uh, slightly older kids who are all skateboarders. And he finds the acceptance he seeks and maybe more trouble than he can deal with. So, uh, but it's Jonah Hill's first film uh, as writer and director. And uh, I, when it came out, it got great reviews. And I jotted it down as one of the ones I do want to see. So. I saw that too. But I, I, my, my only question about it was, I wonder, d does the Clinton era have anything to do with it? Or is that just Good a Good question. Frame? I think it's just putting in the mid, well, it's mid-90s. Putting in the time so, frame. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So head over to focusgroupradio.com, click on the Deep Discount logo, and uh, you'll see Sharky the Shark there. Arr, and you can see him here, too. I, I don't know why he sounds like some screwed up pirate from yeah, Pirates pirate. of the Caribbean. I recommended the three-disc, strictly 80s compilation of great 80s uh, top 10 hits and number one singles. John recommended Jackie on Blu-ray about the life of uh, Jackie Kennedy Bouvier or Nassasis. And uh, the new release this week is mid-90s on Blu-ray. Right, Garrett? Thanks, Deep Discount. We're gonna take a <laughs> we're gonna take a quick break, and when we come back, we're gonna learn a thing or two from Michael Phelps. So stay with us. You're listening to the Focus Group with Tim and John. Learn more at focusgroupradio.com. Focus on the savvy side of 9 to 5 with the Focus Group. Try, really try. Listen, laugh, and learn with Tim and John. I never try anything. I just do it. Welcome back to the Focus Group. John Nash with Tim Bennett. Focusgroupradio.com is our site, and when you visit, you can certainly click on Sharky the Shark and do some deep discount shopping, or you could find out about all the platforms we're on, both audio and video. As we said at the top of the show, um, Michael Phelps uses a simple trick to stay focused on his goals. Uh, so we thought being the new year and January is filled with things that we want to like remind ourselves to accomplish and resolutions, etc. I thought, you know, learning from someone who's a world-class athlete, uh, how they set their goals and keep them, I thought would be very smart. So what did you think, Tim? I was loaded. <laughs> That was loaded. I um, I was surprised because it was simple. It was very simple, yeah. And I, I wondered if this is how he also um, won as many Olympic medals as he did. But essentially, he says to stay motivated, he keeps a reminder of, he wants to, of what he wants to achieve in his closet so that he sees it every day as he gets dressed. It's the first thing he sees in the morning. And the important part about it, I think, is that he doesn't want anyone else to see it. He says, I write my goals down on a piece of paper, and they're there where I can see them. I have to see something for why I'm getting up in the morning and what I'm... That's the part that... That, uh, that runs through this a lot, where he says, I have to have a reason. I have to see something for why I'm getting up in the morning and what I'm doing that day. 
Like, I don't necessarily need a reason to get up. I mean, I'm up. Well, but you know what I'm getting at, right? Yeah, and a lot of successful, and I'll put that in quotes, people, um, not that Phelps is not successful, but a number of people say that if you start your day off then, on a positive note, whether it's that, or a lot of people say just making your bed. If you get up in the morning and you make your bed, you've accomplished something that day, and it starts the day off on the right foot. Now, whether the rest of the day goes south or... <laughs> Just why I love you. You're so pragmatic. Or, or something else happens, but at least you have that accomplishment. Now, I hate making the bed because I had to do it as a kid so much, and I do do it now before I leave at a length of time, but some days I don't make the bed. Do you make the bed every day? Yeah, so actually that piece of advice, I don't know how long ago we had read or heard that. Um, I, when, I, when I get up, I, I get up after Bob, about uh, 40 minutes after. Um, what time is he get up? It's like 6.15, 6.20. get up around 7? I get up at 7. I'm going to try to get up at 6.30 moving forward because I'm doing this thing where I'm trying to block out all my time and effectively. You like Phelps? You're writing a list? I do have a list, but I, I have to say that his rec his approach is cleaner in the simplicity of the one thing that he wants to get done on that day. But I do make the bed right away. It's the first thing I do is make the bed. But I do it for different reasons. I heard someone I, someone once recommended that bed-making trick as a way to establish the difference between sleep and, like, you're done. You're done in the bedroom. Now you can change, and, and that's the room is that the room's purpose has been served. It's ready for the next. See, my travels with you, when I've traveled with you, I used to always just amaze. Now, I would, I, when I wake up, I get up. I get out of bed. I think, and I don't know this because I'm not in the bed with you, I think you get up and you read or you do something. I used to. And you wake up that way. I used to, yeah. Because I used to laugh. I would get up. So I could, I wake up, I get up, I get out of bed. I go downstairs, I do coffee, whatever. Turn on news, I, I get into the day. You'd come bounding downstairs and take out a frying pan and start making breakfast. Yeah. And I used to laugh and I'm thinking, how is he just, if he was like me and just getting up and going downstairs, but I, that's why I always thought you probably were up and you were, oh. you're getting into the day a bit, a bit, um, differently in the bed reading or checking your, mm -hmm. your a mail. So you're able to come right downstairs and say, now it's time for breakfast. So now I, I, I make the bed and then I go and make breakfast and breakfast is always. But do you lie in bed first and read a little bit or whatever? Not anymore. So no. you up, make the bed downstairs. And then I go to the uh, kitchen and I do two whole eggs. So you'll make breakfast right away. Yeah. Two egg whites, three ounces of Canadian bacon and a slice of. Uh, Why not wait an hour? Uh, okay. So if I'm going to have breakfast later, then there has to be exercise before that. Okay. So maybe I'll, if in the summer, if I'm on a training plan for cycling, I'll go out and do like a 15 mile or 20 mile bike ride, then have breakfast. And then that your whole system's like going to burn up all those calories. But I think eating breakfast right away is a good idea, personally. <laughs> At least my stomach is happy about that one. So um, back to Phelps, though. It's a handwritten goal he puts in the closet. Um, not every day do I want to get out of bed. Not every day do I feel great. So I want to see exactly what I'm doing and why I'm putting myself through this. This is, again, this theme of, are his days that bad? He has to, he makes it sound as if he needs to accomplish something every day, okay. even if he's only feeling at 10%. Well, that's another, to accomplish right. something. that's a great, I'm glad he went there. All right, so he said, to Phelps, achieving his goals is the definition of success. His, so his personal success means he achieves his daily goals. Um, and he said, for me in the sport of swimming, the star at the end is changing the sport and then everything else is in the middle. All the, all the records, medals, everything else that came, but the big goal was just to change the sport, which he did. So he now works for the Coca-Cola company. Um, Colgate. Colgate, I'm sorry. And it's all their clean, it's a clean water initiative. Right. Um, about how to save billions of gallons of water. But that 10% thing that Tim said is... Uh, you know, he says, you're laying a foundation to give, and, and it's able to give you the opportunity to get these little, because everything doesn't, he said, Rome wasn't built in a day. You can't do everything at once. Remember, everything is a small step. And lots of small steps will add up so, to, to big, big things. Um, do you beat yourself up if you don't get no, things done? I just move what I was supposed to get done today to tomorrow. <laughs> And on computers, that's really simple. You just look at the calendar program, take the block, and, <laughs> and move it to the next day. Like, okay, I have stuff I was supposed to do last February that had moved forward. I, get, I, I was thinking about that in the car today. I was going up, and I thought I was supposed to do that about three months ago. You know, um, stuff like that. Do you beat yourself up over? No, 
because lately, I, I think we get a lot done. I know we get a lot done. And I, I, lately, I'm looking at folks in my life, some parents, our parents in particular. And I'm wondering, at the end of the day, so are you going to like lay in bed and say, oh, I really wish I had done that to-do list? You're not going to even think about it, right? Right. So I don't know. It's, uh, it depends on what it is. But this thing that Tim mentioned before about this is a good piece of advice for if an athlete, an athlete in training or just the day. So Phelps says, I always said that if I went into the pool and I was having a bad day or I was in a bad mood, I would basically just pump a workout out and I'd try. He says, if I can, if I can get 10% out of those days where I feel like absolute crap, 10% is better than zero. So that's that's a weird way of answering. Do I feel bad if I don't? Well, if you're still getting all this other stuff done, yeah. don't beat yourself up over it. Be patient with yourself. That was something a lot of the guys at the boat club I belonged to had given as advice many, many times as we'd all gotten older and our bones would get creaky. And we might go out and not have a best row as we, we would like row. to have. And he would best row of the day. Because you're still rowing. You're on the and river. It's the well, best one of the day. You're on the river. And so there's, I, if you didn't do one, if you didn't go out and row, you would have done nothing. So it was the best row of the day. Mm -hmm. And if you look at it that way, saying, God, we had a horrible workout or we didn't get, we didn't do as well as we had thought. I don't know. I, don't, I also don't think, though, if you're sick, you should be going out and working out if you don't. Well, that's a whole other, that's a whole other well. thought process. And when he know. says he feels like crap and he's still going to go out and do a workout. But he gets through it. Uh, there not there a rule that our, all our coaches and people that have helped us in athletics over the years talk about? If it's from the neck up, go ahead and do your thing because it's a head cold. If it's something in your chest, yeah. lay low. Like, you know, you, your, co your rowing coach has probably told you that, right? Yeah, I mean, if you were sick, you didn't. Because you're just going to be useless. So rowing is different because you're relying. It's a sport. Right, and they're relying on the other seven or the other, other three people uh, in the boat. So... If you're the weakest link, the boat's just not going to... Whatever happened, you are the weakest link. Weakest link. By the way, did you see the new show? Or not the new show. Deal or No Deal's back on? So it's got a little hitch to it. Is that the one with the... Uh, the ball guy, Howie Long. Howie. Or Howie, whatever his name is. Mandel. Howie Mandel. Howie Mandel. So now, it's, so it's Deal or No Deal. They still open the briefcases with the different money. But then when they get toward... You might get... Well, I'll give you money where you think you might want to take the deal. In order to sweeten the deal... They're now bringing you a mentor or somebody you might want to have met or somebody that might help you with your business. So I saw one over the over the over the the weekend where a woman wanted to start this vegan ice cream or something, and they she was going to take the money, and then they said, and if you take the money, we're well, also going to have you have mentoring sessions with some other guy who started some ice cream thing, ice cream empire, and she thought that was worth, obviously, having the mentorship plus the money. Did so she, she did took the money. She did it. Which ended up being a good thing because if 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 she didn't take the money, she would have gone down and got five thousand bucks, and I think she ended up with one hundred and forty thousand plus this mentor. Ooh, okay. But they're offering this mentorship thing or kind of these experiential things to people beyond just the money to entice you to take take the deal. I wonder how that came up. Like, I wonder they're sitting around they're trying and to reboot it, right? Yeah, but I mean, they had to think about that. Like, what are we going to give them? You know, what, what about luck? How easy is that show to host? I'll take number 17, Howie. I used to. Well, okay. On the subject of game show hosts, there's going to be a day when Alex Trebek is not hosting Jeopardy. I hope it doesn't come anytime Why? soon. Why? He's only 79. Well, he's been How doing it. I don't know, but this is, I, this is his thing, right? This is what he does. You know, he used to do concentration. I remember concentration, too, yeah. Poor thing. And, and Dick Clark did the pyramid, Yeah. right? And nobody could do it better than Dick. No, no. And um, nobody, Bob Barker, nobody does prices right better than Bob Barker. Richard Dawson. Family, family feud. feud. You nobody knew right does away. It so now, yeah. So I don't know. I thought to myself, if you get one of those gigs, Monty Hall. Let's make, let's a, make deal. a deal. There you go. So these these names are those shows, right? Say Jack, Wheel of Fortune with Vanna White. <laughs> Listen. And Vanna White gets like this incredible. Chuck Willery used to do it too, as you remember. Yeah. But I wish they would play some of the old Wheel of Fortunes where they would, you know, I'll take the ceramic cheetah for three hundred and eighty dollars. <laughs> you want the rest on the counter? Gifts. You remember some of the showcases? The they, all the crap just... they would get. But I was reading somewhere that so Pat Sajak makes I think sixteen million a year. Could be wrong. And Vanna makes about eight. But th they tape the whole year in thirty days. So all the shows are done in like whoa, a whoa, month. Whoa, 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 whoa. The whole year? Yeah. 
They do it in like a month, month um, and a half. They, might, they have to do like three or four shows a day then, right? Yeah. And then they travel. How tough is that? Spin the wheel. <laughs> you know, I think it's a little they're, harder they're, than... They're 20-minute 20, 20 shows. You change your clothes. They look on the calendar. They change the set. It's got a green screen. It's Christmas. It's Halloween. It's Thanksgiving. It's spring. It's summer. They're in Disney. It is theater of the mind. And then they and then they you know. and then they spend the other time when you see them. We're here in the beautiful Orlando resort of blah blah blah. You know they go around, they travel, they, they do, do these little things. cameos. But I thought, what a gig that is. Well, I had a friend whose girlfriend got selected to be on Jeopardy, and uh, they and when she went out, they told her you have to bring X amount of outfits, five outfits at least. And you have to plan to be there for at least two to three days because yeah. it was all back to back to back to back. Now, she got eliminated after the first, maybe she made it to, no, she got eliminated after the first uh, show. But he said they, they wrap up, Alex disappears, they clear the audience out, and then the new audience comes in if they have, you know, that. And then the costume, they change their outfits and he comes out. It's a new day. Yeah. And I think they do Jeopardy in one. They do one month in one in four days. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, I mean, they. You know, it depends on the different shows. I think, but I, I do. I was reading about Wheel of Fortune. I was shocked because I thought, what a pretty good gig that is. I want to spin a letter. I'll, I'll spin. Hello, hello. I will spin letters for eight million a year. I might even wear a dress for eight million. And if you ever, do you ever like watch, it, do you ever watch Wheel of Fortune, Vanna has in her contract she's allowed three seconds of alone time on air. So it's funny when they walk out, and then I always count because then they spread. He goes off to the contestants, and then she walks by herself one and two, two and three. three. <laughs> Who cares? In her contract, you get three seconds. Oh, okay. I get three seconds of alone time. Hey, that's the focus group. <laughs> Thanks to our friends at Deep Discount for uh, being part of the Focus Group. Be sure to go to focusgroupradio.com and click on the Deep Discount logo and start shopping away. Uh, what did you recommend this week, Jackie? Jackie, and you recommended the, I recommended uh, the 80s, 80s compilation. Mid-90s was the... Uh, Clinton era, mid-90s. Clinton era, mid-90s was, 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 the, was the choice. Thank you, John, and thank you, Garrett. Thank you, Mr. Nash. And uh, remember, everybody, don't uh, arrive alive... Or, Arrive alive. Wait, I, John, I wish we had you mic'd for that one because... <laughs> Don't arrive alive. It, I saw a lot of idiots this over break texting and driving, and I go by and I blow the horn to give them the finger because they're all over the road. You could always tell. You could always tell when they're... Arrive alive. The Don't, te Don't text and drive. Arrive alive. Wow. I tell you. <laughs>